if you're just doing the status quo type of work and trying to do what's happening now, instead of doing the risky things that are challenging, that may push people's buttons, you're going to be one step behind everyone. Jordan, what's good, man? How are we doing? I'm good, man. What would you say before the call? Another day, another dollar. That's where I'm at. There it is. I mean, you ain't even use a business podcast. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, on that note, we're very excited to have our guest this week, Benjamin Groff. Uh, Benjamin is the owner at Brill Building Music Publishing. He is also the former executive vice president of creative at Cobalt Music Publishing, a position he held for quite a long time. Uh, he's got tons of experience in the publishing side of the business. Uh, really enjoyed hearing not only his perspective of kind of operating and really reaching the kind of this executive level across the publishing side of the music business, but also his perspective on just kind of deconstructing what makes a great song from the, the composition to the, the songwriting, all that stuff. So really enjoyed hearing his perspective. Factors. What stood out to you, Jordan? Yeah, so um, I think I think there's two things that we can do with someone who's had as much experience as he had and has been su- as successful as he has, which is not only kind of get really deep into what he does, which is as a music publisher, how he supports artists uh, from a compositional standpoint and how he supports songwriters, but also we got into the values that have that he contributes to to helping him gain such longevity in the music industry. So um, there's a lot of insight there. I took notes while we were while we were recording, and you could probably tell by the callbacks that I have sometimes uh, after he's done speaking. Um, so I, you know, I'm really excited for people to hear not just about songs and songwriting, but how they how they live in the music publishing world um, and what it's like going from, you know being in the the tape room, I think you said it was to being an executive. So there's, I think there's a lot to learn. Yeah. 1000%. So really excited to dive into this episode. If you haven't already do want to encourage you to check out our Patreon. Uh, things are going down in the discord. Uh, it's the they new are. version of, of the DM, right? <laughs> um, Remix coming soon. Yeah, yeah. Down <laughs> in the discord. <laughs> um, So yeah, that's what it is, man. If you guys want to network, if you want some uh, perspective, both from the the community members that are other managers, artists, whatever, as well as our perspective, um, we're also curating some of our favorite industry news bits. Um, Really just trying to create as many opportunities to help you guys grow and prosper in your own careers. So if you haven't already, just go visit musicbusinesspodcast.com slash community. Uh, And go repeat it because it's pretty straightforward. Without any further ado, let's get to the episode. Benjamin, thanks for uh, thanks for virtually coming out. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Jordan. It's good to be here. Absolutely. I hope things are good on your end uh, during all the madness. Uh, they are as good as good can be. Um, actually, in 2020, we actually, as a company for my publishing company and label, we actually had the, the best year so far. And wow, you know, knock on wood. So life could be worse, you know. But um, yeah, doing all right. Right, right. I was speaking to someone the other day and they said, so it seemed like for the the control, things are going pretty okay. And I think that's the metric that we should probably base it off of now as opposed to just, is everything okay? But are the things you control okay? So that sounds like the things you can control are doing pretty great right now. So that's awesome. Exactly. Um, Exactly. So I guess just for starters, I think one of the first things that sticks out to me for people that have been so successful in the music industry for so long are some of the things that have allowed them to sustain that longevity. And I think a lot of that, it revolves around the value set that the person has. So Mm -hmm. um, I guess, but just before we jump into specifics on your career, what are some of those values that you have developed over time that you think have allowed for you to sustain that level of success for such a long time? Sure. Uh, well, I think that might be a two-parter because I think there is the music executive angle, and then I think that there's another subset that applies to artists and songwriters. Uh, number one is uh, hard work. Um, I put in probably easily 12 hours a day. Um, I try to take Sunday off. I'm trying to like get my hours <laughs> down lower but the thing is, is that there's so much to do. There's so much opportunity. Um, and I have so much vision. And also I'm passionate about things uh, that, it's, that it's not really like work, you know? So uh, I think that the work ethic is top level. I mean, I remember when I was working at EMI Music Publishing, like I would go back, I would finish my day around six or seven, 
go home, get dinner, go to the gym, and then I come back like around 10. And the only other person in the office at that time uh, was Jonathan Platt, who's now running, um, he's the chairman or CEO of, of Sony Music Publishing, um, I believe, or Warner Chapel. I think he just he just uh, switched. But like, mm-hmm. John is John is a work animal. I like I'm a work animal, and it's like we're obsessed and passionate about um, the music and in our career. So I think work ethic is is top level. Like, um, there's no one I know who's like really making things happen by just casually, you know, phoning it in. And that goes for for artists too. So it's not just being passionate, but Everyone I know, artist-wise, executive-wise, writer, producer, top liner, they're like they're all obsessed about their their um, their career. So uh, that's one is the work ethic, and then two, I, you know, the other thing that comes to mind is the being fluid, meaning um, seeing the future, have a futuristic mindset, and being able to leave old the old ways of doing things behind quicker than most people do and grasping onto the new things faster than most people do as well. So that includes like um, identifying emerging genres. And I think we're in a very interesting time right now because what happened, what happened a hundred years ago, we had the Spanish flu, Mm -hmm. 1918, 1919, 1920, I guess they were kind of coming out of it. And in every decade, what, usually happens there's like a new sound that takes off a new type of genre and in the 20s it was the birth of jazz music and dance clubs were out of control and it was the roaring 20s so Mm -hmm. part of the answer to that too is like well being trying to forecast the future okay we're what could be, is there a new genre that's going to emerge in the 20s? Or what is going to be the prevalent sounds and trends and jumping on that? So I think it's it's predicting trends. And um, and then also part of that is, I would say lastly, is taking risks and embracing, embracing risks uh, and going for it. And a lot of my biggest signings, when I signed them, a lot of people were like, I actually got some email responses when I was sharing my music. Like a couple of people even thought like I was joking. Like it, it was just so not current. It was a subgenre. And then it, that, that artist or that kind of lane took off. So those would be the three things. One, um, obsession, work ethic. Two, um, we talked about predicting future trends and being having a futuristic mindset. And then third would be the um, embracing risks. Yeah, t- yeah, taking risk and doing risky things, and that also applies if you're an artist, because if you're just doing the status quo type of work and maybe following the charts and trying to do what's happening now instead of doing the risky things that are challenging that may push people's buttons. Like you're, you're that's you're gonna be one step behind everyone, in my opinion. Right. So, so there's a couple of things I want to take out of that. Um, all very good values to live by, especially in the music industry. Um, one of them, be fluid. You mentioned the history of the 20s. You mentioned mm-hmm. the history of before that, and just the history of music in general. And I do think that in order to know where you're going and what and what innovation looks like, and you clearly do, you have to know what it looked like in the past and you generally have to know the history of the music industry, you know? Oh yeah. Um, So I remember reading a book, I think it was called something like so good, they can't ignore you or something like that. And it mentioned as you read it or it mentioned um, in order to kind of see what's around the corner, you have to see what what was behind you sort of, and you saying those things and and saying the history of, um, you know, jazz in the 20s and how that develops and how different sounds develop and you just knowing that in itself allows you to kind of see around that corner right now so right um want to want to want to shout that out um cool and, thanks yeah a- another thing that i want to shout out is that you said when you worked uh you went to the gym <laughs> and i want to just i want to just shout that out because you take you were taking care of your physical health too in between this obsession which i which i think is like sure. a really important thing to to um to say because in the music industry the gift and the curse of it i feel like is 
everyone is, or a lot of people rather, are so passionate about it that you can kind of work on end and on end and on end because it's sort of like a dream come true every single day. So sure. you still took time to to take care of yourself. And then the last thing, I, I you, you made me think of, um, I was watching an interview with Lior Cohen or something like that. And, and one thing that like really stuck with me, and this has to do with your embracing risks, is... Uh, he told me that there's too many people that are aiming in the music industry that are aiming with the safety on. And I was, I was like, yeah. wow, that's like, yeah, that, that like, I feel like him just saying that kind of changed my viewpoint on embracing risks in general. And I think it's super integral, integral part to um, advancing and not just, not just, uh, you know, coming up with ideas, but executing them, even if they may be uh, really risky. So I'll just say all that to say, uh, you know, I, I love those value sets that you put out there. Yeah, definitely. That's a great phrase, uh, aiming with the safety on. And I mean, most A&R people today, I mean, there are some really good ones out there, but most people are now signing purely, mostly off data. And that's what gets the attention. That's what gets, uh, when you get on those data research reports, which is great, it means you've done something right. Right. But, how does when it comes to artists and songwriters, how does the how does the next prince emerge who doesn't have a TikTok? You know, he uh, doesn't. <laughs> so, um, but take you know, like what I, I bet that half the people I know wouldn't sign that artist because oh well, there's no socials, there's no metrics, there's no you know. Let, let, let's wait. Let's let's keep an eye and we'll monitor this artist and we'll see what happens. Versus like, yeah, this person is like amazing. Let's sign them now and, and develop it. Right. I mean, there are some of those examples, but it's it's um, and that's why, in my opinion, I think that music. You know, if you're going to compare 2021 to 1981 or 1971 or 1961, it's just steadily kind of gone downhill i think a little bit i mean and sadly to say that's, that's my own opinion but um yeah yeah no makes a lot of sense um mm -hmm. i know i know you've spent a lot of time trying to distill a lot of your experience in the music industry into some really valuable resources both across kind of the, the book and the courses can you talk a little bit about different topics you felt you really wanted to dive into and certain things that you felt didn't necessarily get as much light and exposure but are, are still really important concepts that make the industry run well yeah, I mean, when it comes to the the courses you mentioned, um, you're referring to. I have two teachable courses that I have released, and this was this was I was going to do this. It was like back burner projects, and then the pandemic happened, and then I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this during this lockdown. I'm right. going to I'm going to make this lockdown to my advantage. And so, I made two courses. They're on Teachable, and you can find them by going to. I have a website also. It's Benjamin Groff. It's G R O to fslikefrank.com and then slash courses and you'll be redirected there. And there's one course called Insider Secrets to Hit Songwriting. And the other course is called The Release Blueprint. And between the two of them, there's over a hundred video modules that I made. And the first, the first course, Insider Secrets to Hit Songwriting, was basically unpacking the 25 years of experience I've had as a music publisher working with songwriters, developing songwriters, uh, critiquing songs, trying to elevate like a great publisher when a song comes in and it's like a B plus. Well, how can we get that to an A minus? How can we get that to an A? How can we get that to an A plus? So mm -hmm. instead of just becoming like a song that's pretty good, or maybe we'll get an album cut. Um, how can we make that into a hit? And it's tweaking and working with writers and also myself learning from those writers, their little secrets, their little tips <laughs> and tricks. And what was happening is sometimes I would get a song in and I would write my feedback. And I realized before I knew it, I wrote 500 words. <laughs> and then a week later, I would write something else. And I was like, oh, there's another 500 words. And then I was like, you know, I'm just going to make this a video a course um, of, of these I call it the insider secrets and they're things that I just don't hear people talk about and there are elements to hit songwriting 
and not just hit songwriting, but what I would call perennial songs, like um, not necessarily writing a cheesy Billboard Hot 100, though we all would love to have a Hot 100. It's like, how, what are the common threads that make uh, hit songs in any genre in any decade? And so this is, that is the one course. The other course is called the Release Blueprint. And that is more for DIY artists who are releasing their own music. And what I found also is myself having a label and we've had, we've had now over a hundred releases. Um, probably the 20th release I had, I like, it was a series of what they call um, trying to catch falling knives. Uh, <laughs> it was release day and we're like, oh my gosh, we forgot to do this. We forgot to do that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Who's uploading to SoundCloud? Uh, what's that new way? What's that new remarketing method that I saw that that um that special webinar on? And and because it's just moved so fast, right? And so I decided, you know what? I have got to create a workable plan that I can hand off to people and hand off to my team, so we know exactly what to do when, and that there's no mysteries, and we have a plan, we have a working procedure, and so this course starts six weeks out from your release. And each mm. module tells you what to do, when to do it, how to do it in full detail. And I, I, I take you through all the steps, uh, all the way to, you know, from six weeks out, five weeks, four weeks, three weeks, two weeks, one week, days up to your release, your release day, and then all the post-marketing activities that we do, which has helped us make, uh, we've had over 200 million streams so far. Which is um, which is pretty good, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would I would say that's I would say that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so basically, the that was my answer to first. I need to get clear and organized with a written plan that I can share with my team, so everyone's knows what's what's happening and when to do what. And after I did that, I was like, you know, this is like a this is a this is a course. Like, yeah. There's so many people releasing music. And when I would go and do seminars at colleges or music music schools, we would talk about artists releasing their music. And I would say, okay, so what's when that's a great song. When is it coming out? And uh, honest to God, some people, a lot of the, the, one of the frequent responses is, oh, you know what? I don't know, but we're, th- we're going to put it out next Tuesday. I was just about to say, it's going to go out tomorrow. We're, that's, <laughs> that's, that's what it is. We're not going to release day, but. We're gonna put it out on Tuesday because it's my birthday. Uh, yeah, and I'm like no, <laughs> don't do that. Because you, you know, the thing is, we artists work so hard on their music, but then when it comes time to actually shipping it and putting it out, it's like, oh, let's just put it out, and it's it, it's almost self defeating. You're almost like defeating the process by not giving yourself, not putting enough as much effort into the actual release and the process plan as you did in actually making the music. Yeah. It almost is like a, a sort of um, a moment where the artist has to let go a little bit of their attachment in a very specific way. So like I've, I've had this conversation a bunch of times with artists where they make a song and they're so excited about it. They're, they're in love with it. They want to release it as soon as they can, even if it's a surprise release. Yeah. And I do feel like there's a little bit of withdrawal that you have to do just a little bit emotionally to say, okay, let's actually discuss what the best way to build up this release is and do this song justice or rather change their relationship with it. I won't say withdrawal, same amount of emotion, but change their relationship with it. Right. Um, I want to dive into a couple of things that you brought up there. Um, one thing that we had uh, before hearing the full description of the course uh, about songwriting is what are the components of a, of a great song at, at just a very high level. Um, you obviously have a lot of experience with critiquing songs, um, writing songs. So at, 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 the, at, a, at a high level, what do you think makes songs stand out and, and turn into great songs? What is yeah. a, what's, what's some of the characteristics of that A-plus song that you're going Absolutely. for? Absolutely. And this is, um, I would say, and to keep things brief, I would say that mm. there's there's three things that I see in most key hit songs, mm-hmm. and two of them I never I never hear anyone talk about this stuff, and it's the one thing I actually kind of had to develop more on my own, and was an epiphany that I only had about ten years ago. Um, but number one is 
melodic rhythm. So when I say melodic rhythm, it's the rhythm that the vocalist sings. So it's the rhythm of the melody, the rhythm of the melody, the mm-hmm. rhythm of the melody, the rhythm of the melody. Right. Um, so my hypothesis is that a great hook is not a great melody. It's not a great mm-hmm. lyric. A great hook is a great rhythm first. So um, if you look back on probably all your favorite songs and the top songs on the charts right now, they all ha- use, will probably have a strong melodic rhythm. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's that one melodic rhythm. Sometimes often there's one melodic rhythm per section of a song. So a verse will have a melodic rhythm that is just repeated over and over and over again. The pre-chorus will have its own melodic rhythm and chorus will have its own melodic rhythm and repetition. And that that melodic rhythm is the God particle of hit songwriting. And it goes back to our prehistoric DNA because like melody is actually a fairly new concept in the whole scheme of humanity. Like I think, if you could probably 30,000, 40,000 years ago, you find the first flutes. As a species, we're 200,000 years old. And if you go back even further, our ancestors are like 2 million. The first genus of the species is like 2 million years ago. So the music and communication was all rhythm based. Yeah. You would go out on the hunt, you would, you would, um, you, you have a successful hunt, you bring the animal back and there's a, you know, a a drum circle around the fire. You know, there's fertility dances. There's, you know, like war chants and and drums and things like that. And so I think that our DNA and our brain is predisposition, predisposition to rhythm. And then if you put a hot melody on top of that and a great lyric, then you're like cooking with fire. Um, So I've got, uh, on my uh, website, I've got a, a huge article on this at benjamingroff.com. And I go into like, I've got all kinds of examples and embeds there to check out. So that's number one. This, And again, I'm trying to keep, keep it brief. But the second one is the second melody. So what I mean by the second melody, and to give you an example of how I realized this is I was having a meeting with a professional songwriter. She brought in her song and she was playing it to me. And I was like, this is legitimately like a really good song, but something just wasn't lighting up in my brain. It was just like, it was a song. Right. I realized that just like you have a great pair of speakers that has a tweeter, a mid and a woofer. If you have like the mids blown out, or the tweeter's not working, or the woofer isn't working, it's not going to sound that great no matter what you put through it. And what I realized was that her song was just kind of like chord. It was like chord or, or strumming and melody on top, meaning there was only one melody being heard by my brain. And that was the melody that she was singing. Mm-hmm. Versus... If you look like at a song like "Every Breath You Take" by uh, by the Police, there's that that amazing arpeggiation, that arpeggiation guitar thing, and then your brain, my at least how I listen to songs is my brain is singing along to that that guitar riff, and then you've got Sting's voice on top of that, and now you've got Sting's voice here. You've got another melody going on down here. Um, so the idea is that. A second melody can be a great guitar riff, a great um, synth line, a great a great bass line. Because remember, a bass line is is a melody just in a lower register. Yeah. And if you listen to a song like Uptown Funk, like there's so many melodies in that song. Like Bruno Mars is singing his melody, but then Mark Ronson's like got. A, chock full song like so much melodies right going on right in, in that song so having those second melodies they're multiple lottery tickets to hook your writer is how i look at it wow. and, yeah and then the um the third is having a unique concept 
and a lyric that evokes an emotion. Mm -hmm. So an emotion doesn't mean that it's a sad. So it can be that it's a sad song and it's causing is causes you an emotion like sadness or empathy or unrequited love, but emotion can also be Nirvana's smells like teen spirit. Like that's teen angst or emotion can be, um, something like pinks get the party started or Beyonce's bootylicious. Like, you know, it's like that evokes an emotion of like, Oh, it's Friday night. It's time. It's time to get on the dance floor or whatever. Right. So, and that it's like unique or that it's um, a concept that is really has a twist. It hasn't been quite said before, or it's a metaphor. So um, those are my, those are my top three. There's some other elements that help, but if you look at your favorite songs and if you start listening to songs that way, you'll find that most of the biggest songs have at least two out of those three elements. And often they have three out of three. Yeah. When you said um, melodic rhythm and we went back to, to rhythm and how that's the foundation of every song, I kind of thought about different genres that kind of use rhythm as the key to it. And the, obviously the first one that came to my head was, was hip hop uh, music because yeah. that's, you know, I'm thinking of like, you know, I've heard verses obviously that are, are a little bit less melodic, but the rhythm is what kind of captures you, but also hooks from people like, you know, Eminem, Nas, Jay-Z, where the melody is the, the the two things that they have out of three is sometimes uh this this great rhythm and then they and then usually almost always a concept and a lyric that evokes emotion i was like literally thinking of songs in my head to go through this rubric with uh as you were saying it so yeah. i'm like super i'm super excited for our listeners to do that as well um i was gonna ask you the question but sam i feel like i'm just like talking the whole time so okay cool cool i'm like i'm like yeah let's do it um another thing i wanted to ask was the songwriters themselves what do you think are key characteristics, value sets, et cetera, um, attributes of, of great songwriters? And how do you cultivate those things to help them create some of the songs that we just spoke about? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And uh, I think this also goes hand in hand, not just with songwriters, but with, with artists. Uh-huh. Because you're almost, better for better or worse, you're almost, almost only as good as your last hit. So you can have a career as an artist as long as you continue to make hit songs. You can think of any career artist who then started to like just not make materials good enough. And then year by year, like that career starts evaporating if they don't have right. the hit songs to, to back up that, that career. Right. So the content and the material, but I will, will say either if it's someone like, uh, Madonna, who is, she's the go-to example for someone who would change her entire identity, every album or new, a new direction or a new yeah. visual identity. Uh, it's the same also with songwriters. Um, two songwriters who come to mind, and th- these are purely songwriters who are writing for, for other people, but two people who come to mind um, who, you know, they don't really, they're, they're, these people are not in the spotlight. Um Actually, a third just came to mind who is more in the spotlight, but there's a guy named Steve Kipner who I used to work with, and he was writing hit songs like in his 60s. Like he had been writing hit songs longer than I have. He'd had he's had hits in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, zeros, and the tens. And it's it's like someone like that is just a phenomenal writer, but they keep up to date with styles. Yeah. And they continue to um, grab onto those people, often they're younger people, who are moving the needle of popular culture. So kind of goes back to be fluid that we spoke yeah, about ex- earlier. Exactly, exactly. Um, another person who comes to mind is a, uh, a writer named Lindy Robbins. And she, um, she recognizes and sees new trends and jumps on them. And then... Uh, even, and then you have someone like Max Martin, who has notoriously kicked off just s- sounds of an entire of entire decades. You know, if it was the late '90s and right. the zeros, 
with every pop song was in a Backstreet Boys, Britney Spears. I mean, that was that's the Max Martin thing. And then he reinvented himself all over again with that guitar, more guitar driven production with Luke. And now he's like, you know, someone like that is always just reinventing themselves, I think. So, um, you know, the, the other analogy is you can be the best disco producer in 1977 and be on t- everyone's calling you. Your phone's ringing <laughs> off the hook. You know, right. and you know what? Even Kiss wants a dis- disco record now. Right. Oh, uh, even Rod Stewart wants to do a disco record. And um, like Kiss did, I Was Made for Loving You. Rod Stewart did, uh, Do You Think I'm Sexy? And these are like hardcore rock blues artists. They're now making disco records. And then 1980, 81, 82. Okay. Disco is not really happening so much anymore. Right. But we're still that producer. who's like, disco is happening. That's 1985. I don't care what anyone says. We're disco's coming back. You know, it's the same thing with hair metal or grunge and like just, yeah. So I think that um, keeping seeing the future and grabbing onto it. And then also something that I do a lot and I know a lot of other successful writer producers do is they really tap into and stay focused on what's happening underground Mm. because it's the underground that starts percolating up. Right. That may become mainstream. So just as a last example, someone I'm really proud to be working with for about eight years now is big Frida. And I, I don't know if either of you know, yeah. Frida, yeah. but uh, she uh, created the the sound of bounce music yeah. out of New Orleans. And it's like, that's, that's the sound of clubs in New Orleans is, and it's like music to shake your ass to and twerk. Yeah. And I just thought like Frida was brilliant, signed Frida. And what I thought might happen is that it was so good that other people might take notice and it might start bubbling up into other genres. And since then, Beyonce has tapped into Frida for on formation. Uh, Drake has tapped into Frida for nice for what. And yeah. now I think Frida is poised to maybe be a breakout superstar on her own and, um, and having some nice moments along the way. Wow. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with that analysis. Yeah. <laughs> So I know a lot of the you know, experience on the publishing side, I mean, you've been able to uh, touch that part of the business through a handful of different kind of uh, organizations that you've worked with throughout the years. But from your perspective, what is kind of the, the path of a music publisher from an entry level to executive? And, and what's your advice on kind of uh, climbing that ladder, if you will? Mm. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, a lot of the chair pe- chairman and CEOs and presidents of publish, music publishing companies started out either, a lot of them started out in what we used to call the tape room. And that's where I started out. That's where Jody Gerson started out. Jody, I think, actually started out filing lead sheets um, at Warren Chapel. But, but um, people like Evan Lamberg, who is at Universal, like, tape room, early tape room operator. And the tape room operator was like the tape librarian. So what would happen is an artist or songwriter would come into the office. They would have their new song. They would meet with the creative staff and then they would come and see me. Hey, here's my new song. And I would go and add it to their DAT reel. And then um, when it was time to like, if someone was pitching songs, like we, Oh, I need 10 cassettes made. We're going to be sending these, out to these a r people. Uh, I was the one who actually would like have to like, I was the tape duplication operator, tape room operator. Yeah. Like that was my gig. But it was great because I was able to hear how each executive, which was pitching songs, which songs got pitched, which didn't, and then get to hear like which songs actually made it to albums and got placed and stuff like that. Or if it's an artist, how um, the executives would pitch these artists to hopefully get record deals and things like that. So today it's, it's a little different, but I think that you have to, uh, as someone starting out, you have to embrace uh, and expect to get those entry level jobs and do them with enthusiasm because it's like, it's an opportunity to learn. And um, so some of those entry level positions might be someone's assistant 
It might be just some clerical things. It might be an intern. Uh, I did two internships before I got my first paying job in the music business. So it's like getting in with doing the research, finding out the music publishers that are making things happen. They may not always be the majors. There's a lot of amazing independent publishers like myself with Grill Building, or maybe it's Pulse or APG or Downtown or Cobalt. And then it's also then putting in the extra work once you're there. So you almost have, you've got your first train, which is you got to do your job and you got to do it great. But then you've, you, then you should be working on your second train. And that is the train that's going to take you to the next level. Uh, so you can leave that other job behind. So uh, I'll give you an example. When I was doing tape room operator stuff, I was begged my boss at the time. Uh, her name was Holly Green. Look, I really want to do song pitching. I really want to move up the, the, the ladder here. I know that there's not a position here for that yet, but can I, can you let me pitch some songs? And after badgering her enough time, she reluctantly said, okay, you can pitch some songs, but not to New York or LA. You can pitch some songs to Nashville. Like, yeah, you're not going to create so much damage if you just, you know, try Nashville. See what you see. Here, here you go, kid. See what you can do. So I started, like, I got done with all my work. And then after work, I, I would stay ex the extra hours and then put in the extra time on my second train. And I started getting cuts in Nashville. And then it was like, now I had credibility. And then I was able just to, to move up that way. But in, in the long run, my job has not really changed in 20 years. Like, my job has always been discovering emerging talent, trying to sign them, and then helping develop them and take them to the next level. So as long, I think, as you're doing that and uh, putting positive energy out into the world, like you'll just, the, the universe will conspire to make things happen right. for you as an executive. Right. So yeah. I heard a couple of things there that I want to um, just comment on. One, you asked your boss if you could pitch songs. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people, that's almost a risk in itself, right? Like you have to be courageous in yourself in, in itself to even do that. And I've seen sure. a lot of people, including myself, earlier on in their careers, kind of hope or try to manifest certain things like that to happen without, do, without actually just asking, you know? Um, so I think that's just a cool thing to, Another thing okay. is, um, one thing that I've tried to get, I've tried to grow in myself, which, which you kind of also validated as well, is that um, when you're given tasks and when you're in a position to do work, to try to do great work for the work itself, not necessarily the, the value, the monetary value or whatever that you can get out of it. So for the, just doing great work for the sake of doing great work. It doesn't matter if you're in the tape room. It doesn't matter if you're working with artists at an executive level, you're going to have your motivations. But at some point, especially when you're doing work that you don't want to do, being inspired and motivated by just knowing that you did whatever it was to the best of your ability. Um, that's something that I'm trying to actively get better at in, in my day. And I think you kind of just said that with, with you and the work that you've done. You just try to do it whatever it was, it didn't matter what it was. You were going to try to do it to the best of your ability. And when people see that, they know that they can trust you, you know? Um, so I just wanted to do a call out for that. But yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that. And there's, there's two um, things that I can further riff on, on, on that end. There's a, a quote by a, uh, you guys know who Tony Robbins is? Yes. Okay. So before Tony Robbins, there was a guy named Zig Ziglar. And I encourage you, if you don't know Zig's work, I encourage you to check them out. Check him out. He's like a fire and brimstone, almost like Southern Baptist motivational speaker. And um, he had a great quote, which is, you can get everything in the world that you want as long as you help others get what they want. So it's kind of like- Provide value. Providing value to others. By providing maximum value to others, you're ultimately going to create maximum value for, your, for yourself. Right. So um, I had another thing. Uh, oh, yeah. The other, there was another really good phrase to live your life by, too. And I've had to remind some people, and I have to remind myself sometimes, too, which is how you do one thing is how you do everything. 
Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> so if, if I have, uh, if I was working for a company or even myself or my employees, and like, let's say, let's say you're working for a company and there's one person that's showing up consistently five minutes late, 10 minutes late, 15 minutes late, or let's say that I'm, I signed someone and I'm showing up for my calls with that person late or I'm not on time, or I forget, uh, or I space, you know, um, that's one thing. It may not be, be too much, even if you're five minutes late. Okay, it's five minutes. But okay, what's the subtext of that? When it comes time to pay, to pay the check to the, to the writer and the artist, like, or like, let's say I make some mistakes here and there. Well, if I make a few mistakes on one thing, what are, what's the likelihood that the statement and the check going out to the writer is going to be on time and accurate? So it's, I know people who have been, uh, this is more in the business world, but they were interviewing someone to pay them a lot of money to, to partner on some project or something like that. And after three phone calls of them showing up late, they're like, you know what? I, this isn't gonna this isn't gonna work just because how you do one thing is how you do everything. So, you know that comes down to being on time, or you know honesty, work work ethic, integrity, right, um, things like that. And it's how actually I've learned this from a guy named Brandon Burchard. Oh, I've read his book. Do you, I, I don't know if you know that name, but um, if you are a company, it'll cost you like a million dollars to hire this guy to work to work with you. Um, yeah. but that was a podcast on how to attract and maintain million dollar clients is like the easy thing. First thing to do, show up on, show up on time. He had high, pro, high performing habits. Is that, is yeah, that exactly. that's the same one? Right? Yeah. I read that book it's, a couple years ago. Happen. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, well, Benjamin, man, just want to thank you for, for taking the time to speak to us. Um, I had a great time. Listening to, listening to the knowledge that you've been able to spit for our audience. I know they'll enjoy it too. Um, the, as it pertains to the publishing side, we don't get to dive into it as much as we would like. So, you know, getting an executive on that side is, is obviously as big as we can get. So just, just want to thank you for, for coming out. In my pleasure. My pleasure, Jordan and Sam. And, you know, it goes back to when you say publishing, the number one thing that anyone can do in, in this business is write a hit song, write amazing material. It comes back mm -hmm. to the material and song, in my opinion, it's songs drive everything. Right. And uh, the, the sub part of that is of course, publishing. So um, as publishers look after songs and songwriters. So right. thanks for, for being on the, for, for inviting me to the podcast. I'm glad I could be here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, and um, I do have a website. It's Benjamin Groff, G R O two Fs, like Frank.com, where I've got all this kind of information there, too. If, if you guys uh, and your listeners found it appealing, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, be safe. Thank you so much again. Thanks, Jordan. See you, Ben. See you, Sam. Man, well, that was a great episode. I really enjoyed hearing what ben, uh, Benjamin had to say. I mean, I think. Um, from kind of bringing the side of, of personal development and embracing risk and, and uh, taking care of yourself physically and mentally and using that to enable peak performance. Obviously, I think that's a very foundational set of skills um, that oftentimes people overlook. I think him talking about kind of the distinction between uh, kind of melody and rhythm and the, the value of trying to strike that good balance between the two. Um, really enjoyed that. What do you think, Jordan? Yeah, I mean, I just think it was an all around super tactical super informing episode um i think a lot of this is boiled down to a science in his courses at benjamingroff.com he also has a book there um how do i get a record deal sign yourself it's pretty interesting uh, we get into we get got into that book which was super awesome but you know one thing about content creators and obviously he is a content creator because he makes courses and has written a book is that he's really good at displaying information for people to consume so i think we got a taste of that during the episode um and i think people people have a lot to learn from this and i know i did so cool totally aligned well appreciate you all for tuning in thank you guys so much we'll be back next week one love we out